Harry and Meghan pursued by paparazzi in New York in what they call a near-catastrophic car chase. It happened after the pair attended an awards event with Meghan's mother. They say they were tailed and harassed for two hours, risking multiple near collisions with other vehicles. New York's mayor says he's waiting for a full report. I would find it hard to believe that there was a two-hour high-speed chase. That would be, I find it hard to believe, but we will find out the exact duration of it. Police describe the couple's journey as challenging, but with no reported collisions or arrests. But the echoes from history for this prince are clear. As the details unfold, we'll go live to Dan in New York. Also on News at 10 tonight. Deadly floods hit Italy, eight lives are lost and thousands evacuated as a red light warning is issued on the pace of climate change. As G7 leaders fly into Japan, Debbie on the country's long shadow of war and China's looming threat over its neighbour Taiwan. Manchester City are heading to the Champions League final as they outclass the holders Real Madrid and... From Corrie to superstardom in front and now behind the camera too, Nina with Suran Jones. What I get out of it, of showing the, the end product, is, is so worth it. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening. Prince Harry has long warned and worried that what happened to his mother in that Paris underpass a quarter of a century ago could happen to his wife. Avoiding media intrusion was, after all, a main motive of the move to the United States. Last night, after an awards event in New York, Harry, Meghan and her mother, Doria, were pursued for more than two hours, or so the Sussexes spokesperson said, by what they described as highly aggressive paparazzi through the streets of Manhattan in what they said was a near-catastrophic car chase. The police account didn't quite match what, what the Sussex statement said. A taxi driver, who took them on part of their journey, confirmed they were followed during his part of it, but it wasn't aggressive. Even as they arrived, the paparazzi and hostile members of the public Megan, Megan, this way. were making their presence felt in New York. Megan, this way, How do you feel about being part of two broken families? But it was as Harry, Meghan and her mother Doria left that intense media interest turned into something more predatory. Hey. ITV News is not showing video of the subsequent chase. New York's mayor questioned how long it really lasted, but did acknowledge it was reckless. Uh, I would find it hard to believe that there was a two-hour high-speed chase. That would be, I find it hard to believe, but we will find out the exact duration of it. But if it's uh, 10 minutes, a 10-minute chase is extremely dangerous in New York City. One witness who saw the photographers chasing Harry and Meghan was Zara Saeed, who'd come to wish the couple well. And as they were leaving um, and Harry and Meghan got into their car, uh, you know, the paparazzi just kind of rushed behind them. They jumped on bikes, they jumped into their cars and started following them very quickly. Uh, and it was different from any other event that I've seen Harry and Meghan at, because I have seen them at two other events. And this wasn't the case before. This was definitely different. Aggressive? Aggressive, yeah. Aggressive, very, um, I think aggressive is the right word for it. This taxi driver gave the trio a lift as they switched cars to shake off the press pack, but he has downplayed what happened next. Did it feel like the paparazzi were being aggressive? aggressive? No, 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 no. They were behind us. I mean, they stayed on top of us. That was pretty much it. There was nothing more, you know. They kept their distance. It's just like journalists. But the context is all important here. It brings to mind the appalling manner in which Harry's mother, Princess Diana, was pursued by photographers in 1997 ultimately resulting in her death in a car crash. Harry spoke to ITV about how the paparazzi was one of the reasons he left the royal family. Part of the reason why we're here now. I never, ever want to be in that position. I don't want history to repeat itself. I do not want to be a single dad. And I did, certainly don't want my children to have a life without a mother or a father. Diana's biographer Andrew Morton says Harry and Meghan now face the kind of media intrusion Diana faced 
in the UK? Well, the first reaction is, here we go again. I mean, we, we have a situation where the paparazzi are aggressively following um, Harry and Meghan. Uh, I'm afraid that in America they're fair game. Uh, the media is very aggressive there. Uh, you have uh, p paparazzi TV channels. So they're, they're going to be followed and harassed uh, for the foreseeable future. The precise details of what happened last night are still not clear. But one thing is, Prince Harry has decided to call it out in a very direct way. And Dan, apart from, you know, the clear echoes uh, with history, this is also happening at a time when the Prince's relationship with the press is already very much in the spotlight, not least here. Yeah, I mean, as Andrew Morton alluded to there, I mean, they moved here to the US to escape this kind of press intrusion, and yet they're facing arguably worse here than they would have faced uh, in London. I mean, Prince Harry is involved in several court cases against British newspapers for uh, the illegal, as he would say, gathering of, of information about him and, and his family. He's also suing the British government for not providing a close pre police uh, protection. But their critics have said, look, you know, they have continue to court publicity since they've moved here. There's been the Netflix series, there's been the book, there's been various uh, TV interviews and all of that really uh, has fueled interest in them rather than allowing them to sort of fade away and lead a quiet life in, in California. It has continued to put them on the front pages uh, and therefore I'm afraid uh, their critics would argue that that means that the paparazzi uh, will want to get photographs of them because they know they can sell them to websites and uh, newspapers here for a lot of money. OK, Dan, thank you very much indeed for that. Thank you. Across the world, laws and limits on energy use and emissions are aimed at keeping global warming below an internationally agreed threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius. Going past that point, scientists claim, would trigger more death and destruction to global ecosystems. Now, the United Nations says that benchmark is odds-on to be passed in the next five years. A drought that risks turning southern Spain into a desert. Wildfires feeding on the tinder dry conditions in Canada. Extraordinary weather events, increasingly no longer the exception, but the norm. Humanity's safety net was agreed in Paris eight years ago. World leaders signing and repeating. We're going to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. A pledge to try and keep warming below 1.5 degrees. That the Paris Agreement remains irreversible. Keeping alive 1.5 degrees. Scientists say we're now likely to pass that limit this decade. Just three years ago, the chances of breaching 1.5 degrees over the following five years was 20%. Today, that possibility has risen up to 66%. Even if we don't get there, Scientists are 98% certain will break the current record set in 2016 of 1.28 degrees above pre-industrial levels by 2027. In terms of the science, it's very stark statistic, 98% um, very high level of confidence. The biggest risks for the UK, things like extreme rainfall in the winter and in summer actually, but particularly in the winter, um, prolonged extreme rainfall is increasing. The key underlying driver man-made emissions, greenhouse gases trapping heat in our atmosphere. But there's a temporary, natural phenomenon which is kicking in too, El Nino, a changing of currents in the Pacific which often drives warmer and wilder weather, usually for around five years. Temperatures should then dip back a bit, so we're unlikely to breach the official Paris target, which requires prolonged spells of hotter weather. We've left it really to the last minute to do something about climate change, but it's not too late. Solutions are there. We just have to have the ambition, the leadership at a political level, at an individual level, to actually commit to securing a safe, livable, sustainable future for all. Change won't be easy or cheap. Environmentalists worry even if 1.5 is reached just temporarily for now, once breached, the target will lose its power as a goal to galvanise a green revolution. Martin Stew, News at 10. 
Well, it is some warning, and the authors of today's report couldn't have known but could well have predicted that its publication would coincide with yet another deadly result of extreme weather. Huge floods in northern Italy. A fifth of a year's rain has fallen in less than two days, sweeping at least eight people to their deaths. Across a large swathe of northern Italy, devastating floods are taking their toll, leaving streets submerged. A fifth of the annual rainfall has fallen in just 36 hours. At least 14 rivers have burst their banks. In Faenza, two people were airlifted from their house after it was swamped, a lifeline from the unfolding trauma below. In the debris-filled waters of Cesena, they rallied round to rescue some of the most vulnerable, trapped inside their homes. Italy's interior minister flew over the worst affected areas. More than 10,000 people have already been evacuated from their homes. La media delle, dell the civil protection minister says while around 200 millimetres of rain have fallen on average, in some areas it's reached 500 millimetres. In Croatia, rescue teams are busy after rivers broke their banks. The army has been drafted in to try and protect homes. We have to accept the situation, this man says, but it's hard to fight floods like this. Back in Italy, the Santerno River has flooded part of the Imola circuit, forcing Formula One to cancel this weekend's Grand Prix. With more heavy rain forecast for the days ahead, the authorities are preparing for more evacuations across the worst affected areas. Neil Connery, News at 10. Now, for 11 million people in England, the place they call home is rented. New plans aimed at making it feel more like a home of their own have been set out by the government. No longer will landlords be able to turf people out without good reason. No fault evictions in the jargon. People on benefits or with children or pets won't be turned away. But some landlords say less control of their own properties will mean they sell up. Mandy and Robbie are packing their family life into boxes to get out of a home they don't want to leave. An eviction order is imminent and right now they have nowhere else to go. Being a low-income family, it's, we're not getting anywhere, um, you know, and, and the stress is getting quite high. Um, we both have anxiety and depression. ITV News has spent the last two years highlighting the terrible conditions that some private renters have to put up with. The housing secretary says he's determined to do more to protect those who face eviction, simply for complaining. We're making sure that there are more people in the private rented sector who have the security of knowing that they cannot be evicted from their home uh, on the basis of a, a rogue landlord trying to intimidate them. Under Mr Gove's new bill, the government would scrap no-fault evictions in England, meaning landlords will no longer be able to evict tenants without giving a specific reason. It'll make it easier, though, for tenants to be evicted for antisocial behaviour or if they don't pay the rent. Rent increases, meanwhile, will only be allowed once a year and landlords will have to give two months' notice. The big problem in the background of this bill is a rental market which just doesn't work. The number of properties available for rent is getting ever smaller, while the number of people looking for somewhere to rent is getting bigger all the time. And there's not much in this legislation which addresses that damaging imbalance between supply and demand. Sajad Ahmad is the CEO of the British Landlords Association, but not for much longer. He's selling his 17 rental properties because of government policy he says is counterproductive. With this legislation, it's just going to add to even more legislation, which means it's going to be difficult trying to get your property back. There are that many less properties for renting, and so therefore uh, there are probably 70, 80 tenants chasing one property. How does that help uh, uh, you know, renters? It doesn't. The government says it's taking action against bad landlords and bad tenants. So the rental market might be about to become a bit fairer. But for those people still in desperate need of housing, no better. Geraint Vincent, News at 10. 
Well, the one thing everyone seems to agree would make for cheaper rents would be building more houses. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has been setting out what Labour would do if they win the next election, including building on Greenbelt land in locally agreed locations. And Romilly is here to take us through it. I mean, there's no doubting this is going to be one of those issues that rises up the agenda towards the election. Absolutely. This was a pretty big pitch by the Labour leader to steal a march on some traditional Tory ground. So ever since Margaret Thatcher, every Tory leader has been position themselves as a champion of home ownership and house building. But if we have a look at their recent record, well, it tells a rather different story. So while 233,000 homes were built in 2021-22, one planning consultancy is predicting that because the government has abandoned mandatory planning targets and tightened other protections, this could fall to just 120,000 homes a year being built in England, which is well below the 300,000 that the Tories promised in their 2019 election manifesto. So up, stop, up steps, Keir Starmer uh, spotting something of an opportunity here. In his speech, he said Labour is going to be the party of builders, not blockers. I asked him how far that meant he was prepared to go. You promised to take on planning reform. Does one of the tough choices you refer to include building on the green belt? When I say fixed planning, what I mean by that is giving more power to local areas to direct where housing will be built. Um, and that does mean uh, decisions about the Green Belt. Now, don't get me wrong, just like everybody else in this room, I want to protect the Green Belt. I value our countryside. Um, but this is about choosing where development takes place. That's not going to make everyone happy. The Green Belt has a pretty special place in the national psyche. And Michael Gove was quick to point out today that there are Labour MPs who are blocking developments in their own constituencies. But the problem for the Tories is that after 13 years in power, there's not much of an improvement in the housing market that they can point to. And Labour clearly signalling is going to be an election battleground. Indeed. OK, thank you very much indeed for that, Romney. Thank you. Now, this week's international summit of G7 world leaders in Japan is being held against a worrying backdrop. Even the name of the venue, Hiroshima, is a reminder of where global aggression can lead. But overshadowing this G7 meeting in the Japanese city is the regional threat of China to another of its neighbours, Taiwan. And the Japanese Navy is taking no chances. Defence spending has been doubled, nor is the United States, which has troops based in Japan, most controversial on Okinawa. Okinawa is Japan's southernmost prefecture. It is closer to Taipei than it is to Tokyo. If conflict breaks out with China over Taiwan, this would be one of the Allied forces' front lines. It is the prospect of that war which has led to the biggest increase in Japanese defence spending since the end of World War II. From this year, the military budget will double, bringing it in line with NATO nations. And much of the new resources and weapons will be put here. The governor of Okinawa says Japan's pacifist constitution is under threat. From 1945 to 1972, Okinawa was under American control, and it is still home to 70% of US bases in Japan. Rising tensions in the region have given those bases a greater strategic importance. But every year on the anniversary of Okinawa's return to Japan, a peace march is held with hundreds protesting for the removal of American troops. For many who take part, it is an emotional day, reflecting on the toll past wars have taken. Kiyoko joins every year. Aged five, she was held in a US concentration camp on the island.
This memorial has the names of 240,000 people who died in the 1945 Battle of Okinawa. In a place where the scars of war run so deep, there is strong opposition to the government's military build-up on the island. The Japanese Self-Defence Force has just opened a new base on Okinawa's southernmost island closest to Taiwan. Missile units have been placed there and deployed here on the main island. And more than 1,000 additional troops will be stationed in the prefecture. It is a significant shift in defence policy and posture, one which China has described as dangerous. At US Camp Courtney, we met Colonel Tracy. I asked him about predictions made on when China might invade Taiwan. People who are making predictions can come out here and work on deterrence, put skin in the game, and then ensure that uh, we don't get to an apocalypse. In Okinawa, people are looking to this week's G7 in Hiroshima and hoping world leaders will listen to the ghosts of the past and not let history repeat itself. And Debbie joins us now from Hiroshima, where the G7 summit begins tomorrow. We know our Prime Minister flying in too, of course, uh, Debbie. Uh, Ukraine on the table, firstly, but also China and its relationship with Taiwan, one of the main focuses of discussions there. Yes, Julie, China not here, but looming large in many of the discussions and likely in many of the agreed outcomes. The Japanese Prime Minister has repeatedly warned that Ukraine could be East Asia tomorrow. And as the host, will we be seeking a unified stance on how to deter and deal with China? We understand there has been already some debates on how strong the language should be and whether China should be referred to by name in the final communique. Also high on the agenda, as you mentioned, Ukraine with President Zelensky expected to give a video address here in Hiroshima. Nuclear proliferation, of course, a central topic. And President Biden will be flying in, facing questions and concerns about a potential U.S. debt default. And, and on top of all of that, Debbie, former Prime Minister Liz Truss in Taiwan. A pretty uncomfortable position for the Prime Minister. Absolutely. A timely visit to Taiwan by the former prime minister on the eve of the G7. She was making a speech advocating for an economic NATO to tackle China's growing authoritarianism. The Chinese foreign ministry had a withering response, describing her as a has-been politician conducting Instagram diplomacy. The prime minister, speaking to reporters on the way here to Hiroshima, said the government's position on Taiwan hasn't changed. Debbie, thank you. The police force, which took 31 years to bring the right man to justice for murdering a seven-year-old girl, has made two apologies. One was to the girl's mother. The other was to the man who was wrongly accused and put on trial. Nikki Allen was lured away from her home in Sunderland, hit with a brick and stabbed 37 times. The man who stood trial but was cleared, George Heron, denied being involved 120 times during three days of interviews by Northumbria police. The force accepted today the questioning had been oppressive. The England career of Brentford striker Ivan Toney that was finally taking off is once again on the back burner for breaking betting rules. He's been banned from playing for club and country for eight That's months until January next year by the Football Association. He admitted breaking FA rules on betting 232 times in November alone. To tonight's football now, and what a night it has been for Manchester City as they ease through to the final of the Champions League. City have never won the trophy, but tonight they look like the 14-time winners of the competition, not their opponents, Real Madrid. They won 4-0 tonight. Bernardo Silva got two of them. That made it 5-1 over the semi-finals two legs. Next up, into Milan in Istanbul, and it leaves City sitting pretty for that dream of the treble. Champions League, Premier League and the FA Cup. Nervous, excited, quietly confident, any number of emotions could be found around Manchester City's stadium tonight. Their team potentially just four games away from a Champions League, Premier League and FA Cup treble. We're in front of our home supporters, we've had a good season, so yeah, I'm like 
semi-confident. I'm from the years of where City weren't that great, so I still have like a, a deep-rooted <laughs> panic. <laughs> Let's just pray. I'm always confident, City, but with Real Madrid, they scare me. And they're making some noise in here, Rio. You have to go back five years for the last time Manchester City lost at home in the Champions League. Extend that record against the Masters Real Madrid this evening, and that elusive, longed for European prize is one step closer. City dominated the opening exchanges, simply starving Real of any possession. And but for the giant Courtois, Haaland would have set them on their way. Their reward finally came. De Bruyne found Silva lurking close to goal. And City were ahead. It was turning into a first-half masterclass. Grealish always menacing, and then Silva, loitering again, struck for a second time. The conductor knew his orchestra was pitch perfect. On the rare occasion Real did threaten, Alaba found Edison on irrepressible form. City's date in Istanbul was settled with their third. De Bruyne, it's gone in! It's an own goal, is it? Akanji first to De Bruyne's cross, Madrid's Militao doing the rest. City supporters celebrating as only they can. The reinforcements completed Madrid's humiliation. Foden's invention, Alvarez pouncing, and the demolition was done. So, still on form and still on course. If Rail's superstars couldn't stop City, it's difficult to see who can. Steve Scott, News at 10, Manchester. Incredible now. In films and popular imagination, the luxury liner, the Titanic, sank back in 1912, of course, when it hit a floating iceberg. New pin-sharp images of the wreck may update, not to say correct, everything we thought we knew about the sinking. The images have created this realistic, life-sized 3D scan from which it's hoped researchers can learn about the ship as it is slowly destroyed by microbes and salt corrosion. Finally, from Coronation Street through Scott and Bailey, Dr Foster and Gentleman Jack, to name just a few, the actor Suran Jones has become a leading light of TV drama and not just in front of the cameras. She's helped create and produce as well. But in her latest ITV drama called Maryland, she's taken another step forward, as she told us, in creating her own story, focusing on the difficult but sadly familiar emotion of grief. What's Dad said? I don't know. I couldn't get in touch with him. Neither could the police. That's, that's why they called me. Do you mean he doesn't know yet? It is a screen family drama created by someone who has real experience of loss. What about some Westmoreland Road do you want? Yeah, it's the mortuary. Our mum has died. In Maryland, Saran Jones stars alongside Eve Best in a story about two sisters and the fallout from the death of their mother. Creating the story alongside writer Anne-Marie O'Connor, Jones says her success means she can take some control over the stories she wants to tell. There's so much content and um, as an actor, it's, that's an amazing place to be as a, a woman in my 40s as well. Amazing um, content and the roles that I've been given, I feel very fortunate. Um, but I felt like I wanted to almost go back to my roots with um, a northern piece and I wanted it to be about family. In 2016, her mother died after suffering from dementia. Her father, who got COVID, passed away five years later. The drama tackles grief head on. This piece is about in-depth um, uh, sibling relationships and in-depth reaction to grief. And we don't shy away from it. It's also brave of you. I know a little bit about the life of carers, the life of... Um, people who have suffered with illness and then moving past that what does death do to people and I think I have a level of experience that I wanted to share. No I got the job because I'm good. The jobs have Linda. kept coming since her arrival on Coronation Street two on decades ago. Dr Foster won her a BAFTA. Oh, we have to go. Strong female characters are her on-screen trademark but producing behind the camera now has Saran Jones hooked. It's, it's three times as much work because you have to create it and then you have to, um, you know, you have to crew up and then you have to make it and then you have to edit it and be in the post and then you have to sell it and be all part of, you know, every aspect of that. But I, what I get out of it, of showing the 
The end product is, is so worth it. The end product will be on screen next week. Nina Nana, News at 10. And that is all for tonight. We will see you tomorrow. Good night.